Welcome to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White, the real dragon slayer, author and entrepreneur sales coach. Tune in weekly for human conversation about business and sales. Enjoy business expert interviews, educational episodes, and virtual cuppers with entrepreneur business owners. So grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy. Here is your host, Jules White. So welcome to the Human Conversation. This week, I am speaking to Helen Pollock. I'm really excited about this because I don't really know Helen very well. And it's actually quite exciting when you have a conversation with someone that you don't know so well, because I don't know what we're going to find out. How lovely listeners. So Helen's the director of Her Next Chapter. I love that name, Helen. She's a personal brand strategist, a business book coach, and a ghostwriter. Helen, sounds a bit spooky, doesn't it? Welcome to the Human Conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Jules. I'm very much looking forward to having a human conversation. Yes, me too. So um, I know my listeners, my regular listeners will probably know what I'm going to ask first, but it's always such a great place to start because obviously what you're doing at the moment is very book oriented. You know, I can hear the book stuff in there with the ghost writing and the, the business book coach, but also there's this personal brand stuff in there too, which is very fascinating. So let's find out where this all started, Helen. Tell us what you were going to do when you left school. So my first ever work experience at of any kind was at Vogue magazine. No, that's so glamorous. I love that. <laughs> Do you know what? It, it's hilarious, really. But also, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit impressed. Like, 15-year-old me thought, I want to write for a living. I fancy journalism. What's a really big-name publication? Vogue. Great. Now, I, I don't, I'm not particularly interested in fashion. I wasn't particularly interested in fashion then. But I, it would have been about, right, you know, this, this all, you know, I'm going to aim high. They can only say no. So, um, so that's what I did. I sent, um, sent a letter off uh, in the autumn term of my fifth year at school. And I was asked to come for an interview um, so over the Christmas holidays from school, I went down with my parents and had an interview with the managing editor of Vogue to have one week's work experience in June. And I, I got the gig um, and I started there on my on Monday, the 25th of June, which happened to be my 16th birthday. I love that. That's so cool, isn't it? So did you, were you one of these who stayed on then till 18 at school and did you go to uni and stuff? Yeah, I did. Um, so language and communication has always been my thing. Mm. Um, foreign languages I loved. So I, I, my, my A-levels were French, German and theatre studies and then I studied French and Italian at university. Amazing. So do you carry on speaking it when you sort of went into your your normal life? To a degree. Um, I usually found some way to use my languages because I, I also speak Spanish and some bits and bobs of other things as well. Um, so, for example, I worked at Aston Martin. <gasps> All these names you're throwing at us, Helen. <laughs> do you know what? Just, <laughs> it's so not... It, it gives an impression that it's so not like me. I'm I'm not, I'm really down to earth. I'm not like, you know, I haven't had my hair cut by hairdresser since 2007. <laughs> Great. I, it's like, <laughs> I was always meant to not be corporate. I was always meant to own my own business for sure. So don't, please don't think, you know, I don't know, don't get the wrong impression of me that I'm some like uber glam, really put together person because I'm not. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so so that was it. It was always for me. It was always about communication, whether that was written or verbal, and it and also about relationships because obviously that's what communication is all about. Yeah, very much. 
So I, I'm absolutely, I'm the epitome of a, of a people person. Yeah, no, me too, though. Maybe that's why we connected so well. <laughs> so, so you've done your degree, you're, you're beautifully versed in languages, which I'm actually a little bit jealous about, because I think I was that wannabe person who always wanted to be able to be speaking other languages fluently. And I did really well in languages, but just really to sort of O level and then left school. I left school at 16 and I was working by the time I was only three months into my 16th year. You know, so I was such a baby. My son's 16 now, so it's so so strange to think I was full-time working then. Um, and so I didn't do the uni thing and the kind of academic side of it. So when you left uni, what was the first job then that you went into from there, Helen? So um, I um, went into a trainee PR account executive job um, because I, I did actually go for um, a an interview at our local um, paper, but they wanted you to be, to like run a car, your own car, um, and live on like six grand a year. Yeah. And I mean, this was like the nineties, but it, even then, the, the sort of your graduate trainee sort of salary would be fourteen, fifteen, something like yeah. that. Yeah. I just thought, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if PR was another way that I could write for a living, but it, I wouldn't need to eat beans on toast for years. Yeah, so it was better. Yeah. But PR is a kind of place, isn't it? It's an interesting place, PR. How long did you stay in PR? So, I mean... I So I, I after graduating, I did a post-grad marketing and management course for a year and that was where I learned about PR um, but actually I, I ended up going into often marketing I've, I've done general I've worked in every area of the marketing mix I've been head of marketing and PR um, I was head of customer research at Aston Martin for a while which market research is so not me <laughs> that's like, all, like detail and yeah so I took the role in a different direction made it more sort of training the engineers how to use the information to you know to um create better decisions about new models and stuff like that but anyway um PR I mean really it's it's like being an in-house journalist in many ways but I remember starting when I, I was head of marketing and PR for um, a computer games company for a little while and when I started there you know it was a all young people we go to the pub after work um, on a Friday had a whale of a time but someone was like oh PR isn't that corporate lying <laughs> I was like no it, it should be the opposite <laughs> yeah it should be yeah I think it's like it, Ab Fab's got a lot to uh, answer for yeah <laughs> that's so true <laughs> it's great I did love that to be fair so tell yeah, tell us what happens next then. So you're in PR and you've you know you're doing all this wonderful work for and and the brands you've mentioned have been exciting already. I feel like you're still young at this point. I'm like, wow, <laughs> it's been great. So what <laughs> happens next? So um I guess a whole load of things started came into motion with um the kind of financial crisis. So I was made redundant from Aston Martin um, at the start of the global financial crisis. In, in a four month period, I'd just gone back to Aston Martin to take up the customer research position after go, leaving there and going to the computer games company. For um, And then as I went back to Aston. I'd been there like four months. The financial crisis hit and, you know, it's last in first out yeah, yeah and then another former employer asked me to come back to a um a new role and literally within another yeah another couple of months they realized they too were in the doo-doo and it was the same so in, I was made redundant twice in four months oh it's hard so I was literally you know what, what whatever I, I, I was a single woman at the time I had a hundred grand mortgage all on me mm. um so I had one lodger already, and my, my place is uh, um, a th was a three-bedroomed uh, apartment. 
I rented out the other bedroom as well. And I managed to get through 11 months contracting my two lodgers without borrowing any money from anyone to get through. Wonderful. And then I got a, I took a job as assistant to the events director at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and then I met my other half as, as a direct result, actually, of being made redundant. So, you know, people and this is probably really very relevant right now. At the time, being made redundant twice in four months seemed like a very, very bad thing. Mm. And having to hustle to find the ways to, you know, to cover my, my bills and stuff. Yeah. Actually, as a direct result, I met my other half and we had, you know, two beautiful children who are now nine and five. Amazing. So if that hadn't have happened, I may never have met him. And I may, I was 35 when we met, 37 when I had my nine-year-old daughter and 41 when I had my five-year-old son. Yeah, so you were an older mum. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was an older mum in a way. I was 35 when I had Sam. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that was definitely in that later section of mums having babies. Um, I was always told I was an at-risk mum by my midwife, which I always appreciated from her, which, you know, it was like, why would you say that to somebody, you know? It scares <laughs> the life out of you. But um, it's really interesting. I always think as well, Helen, that... If I'd had a baby when I was younger, I'm not sure I would have been quite such a good mum. Um, and I'm not sort of saying I'm this brilliant, wonderful mum, but I feel like I was very comfortable being a mum at that age. And if I'd have been in my, uh, I don't know, in my 20s even, I think I would have been terrible at being a mum. You know, I don't think I knew who I was really so much back then. So I don't know if you felt the same having your children a bit later in life, you know? Yeah, I, I do. I think... Um... I certainly got all my partying out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely, I had a really, really good time for a long time. Um, and and therefore, I, I in no way resented give it, giving that up. And I, I've changed an awful, awful lot as a person since, you know, having the children, as, as you do. Mm. Um. I'm, I think it was absolutely the right, there was the right time and place for me. Yeah. Um, and it also, it, well, it also directly led to me starting my own business finally. Great. So how old were you when you finally did that? So it was, that was eight years ago. So I'd have been 38. It was a year after my daughter was born and I, I didn't want to go back to a corporate role. I'd have mm. had to go back to full time to that role. And I wasn't really that into it anyway. So yeah. I set up a Mandarin Chinese language school. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do you know what? I thought you were going to say, so I set up a communications company, you know, PR, and, and it's a Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That was a language you never told me you spoke. Yeah, that's because I don't really speak it very well. <laughs> but I did employ people who did. <laughs> this gets better. This conversation gets better and better. Oh, fantastic. Whatever made you decide that that was what you were going to do? There's got to be a story here, Helen. Yeah, it, there is. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I am a linguist. I did a bit of... Um, primary school after school French club teaching um after I'd had my daughter and I kept hearing on the radio and the, you know the well, one on news oh we don't have enough Mandarin speakers um we're falling behind economically because we don't have enough Mandarin speakers um a lot of people are like, oh I, I it's a, you know you're amazing I, I found, found language is so hard and that's because there's a neural pathway in the brain that's open until you're about 10 years old because you're learning your mother tongue. Yeah. If you start learning a foreign language before that point, and it's really it's, it's before you start secondary school. Yes, yeah. Then that neural pathway stays open in your brain for the rest of your life. So you find it easier to learn foreign languages forever. And that's I'm one incredible. of those people. 
because we lived in Dubai when I was a child and I started learning like Arabic at seven and French at eight so oh that's why that that's is why. such a, an awesome piece of information that I truly didn't know isn't that amazing so why on earth do we have a curriculum where we start well certainly when I was at school you didn't start your languages till you were in the first year of your senior school which would have been what 11 um, it might be different now, to be fair. I think Sam did touch on a bit of French when he was younger. But yeah, that's really interesting. Oh, I do wish that I'd learned my languages as a, a younger child then, because I think I probably would have pursued it. I really do. Yeah, I, it's, you know, foreign languages have got this um, reputation for being difficult, but that's the reason why. Yeah. And in only in the last few years, it's now the law that schools have to, primary schools have to teach uh, one foreign language from uh, key stage two, so age seven. And that will make a big difference mm. um, to our children. But so, so yeah, I thought, okay, Mandarin, that's the time to learn it in primary yeah. school. Can't see anyone else really doing this in my area. And I, I live in um, Leamington Spa. In I was going to ask where you were, actually. What a lovely part of the world. Lovely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, I do like it. So that's what I did. But I actually couldn't, I couldn't make a profit from it. I, you know, I spent five years tweaking that business model every which way, mm. taking it online, going into secondary schools as well. And fundamentally, there wasn't enough meat in the sandwich between the Mandarin teachers who there's not that many of them. And they charge a lot as a result. Yeah. And the schools or parents that there wasn't enough in that equation for me to be a profitable middleman. So, yeah, yeah. so then I I thought, okay, um, I'm gonna wind that business down and start a PR consultancy instead. And that immediately was like, oh, it, it <laughs> just felt. It was like a weight off my shoulders. It felt so much easier, yeah. like you weren't swimming against the tide anymore. Um, and it was profitable from the outset. Yeah, wonderful. I love that. So you actually did come back round full circle in the end to where you'd sort of started out, really. Yeah, I, I did. And then a couple of months um, after I started that, an existing client asked me if I would be up for ghostwriting his second book, he already had an Amazon best-selling book but he now didn't have the time to write this second book so I said yeah I'd, I'd love to and then that one became a bestseller as well and then other people started coming to me um, about ghostwriting but then also saying actually I want to write my book by myself but I know I need some support and accountability do you think you could help me with that and I thought well yeah I think I can um so that was how the book coaching <laughs> came about it's like this evolution isn't it you know when I listen to your story that this is what I love I think about this entrepreneurial space you know these things just seem to evolve so beautifully and it's interesting actually Helen because obviously I've written a book um, I'm also writing a second book but it's much slower because I've got super busy I'm not trying to make excuses but it has gone on the back burner a bit um and I know the, the sort of process of writing a book for me was such that I needed a writing coach. I did want to write it myself, but I needed a writing coach to help with structure and equally accountability. Um, and so I think, you know, what you're doing is incredible and very needed for anyone who does want to write a book, whether it's you write the book as a ghostwriter or whether it's you help them to write a book. It's massively important that anyone thinking about writing a book, in my opinion, engages with somebody like you. I really think that's important. I think it's one of those things, just like any big project, it's, it feels like Mount Everest. Mm. Yeah. And that leads to so many people. I mean, very often when people get in touch with me, they've been thinking about writing a book for months or even years they might have even started it and got so far and then ground to a halt and so uh, you know working with a book coach we can help with the structuring the content so that it's right for the audience and it's right for you and where you want this book to take you 
Um, and also just breaking it down into manageable chunks. Mm -hmm. That's the key. That's the key because if I had to just write the book, it, it was the Everest, it was the mountain. Whereas if you say, right, we're going to focus on chapter one or this section or whatever it looks like, that was exactly how I wrote my book. It had three sections. I actually wrote section two first. Yeah. Then I wrote section three and then I wrote section one, which, you know, and that really surprised me. But I was very open to going with the flow of how I needed to write this book, which was quite fascinating, Helen. Because I would have thought I would have had to have written it from the start and right through. And I really didn't have to do that. It's, it's really something going through that journey, I think. It is. And I think it, it often surprises clients to learn that we, we always tend to write the introduction and the conclusion last. Yes. Because yeah. you, the meat of the book might change how those look by the end, yeah. you know. So, yeah. um, so it's, that, that is something that people are often like, oh, oh so I didn't really? start with the introduction. <laughs> no, you did do that last. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. So fascinating. I'm sure I could talk to you about books for a very long time, Helen. But tell us about, you see, we talked in the beginning that you are a brand strategist, mm. a book coach, and also the ghostwriting. How's that split in terms of how you do your business? So, you know, as you say, um, it's an evolution. And it came about, so there, my business was the content doc but then um i became founding partner in the biz book foundry with catherine williams who's catherine. a yes. yeah lovely catherine and catherine's been on our podcast yes indeed yes a long time ago but she is in the episodes there you will find her <laughs> yes yeah, she did she told me she did um, so you will know that so she is a she's a book layout designer, which in old money was known as a typesetter. Yeah. Um, so she in her own words, she makes books beautifully easy yes. to read. I love that. So I help with the writing. She helps with the design and production side of things. Um, but then with the other part of my business, I noticed um, that. So I. My ideal customer is a woman. And that's not to say that I don't have fabulous customers who are men, but my passion is for helping women to tell their stories. Yeah. Um, because I, in all honesty, I think they need a little bit more help to do so often in, in terms of suffering from a lack of confidence, which I can, I can give, you know, I'm quite a nurturing person and I can help them to feel more confident about that and when I when I say that I noticed that these fabulous women were coming to me for help with a book and many of them have you know they might have MBEs or OBEs and they were saying the same thing to me which was Helen I'm, I'm not sure anyone will want to read this I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. like, really <laughs> it's so true isn't it it's so true yeah so what I realised was many of my ladies had similarities and they often had were either they were on the cusp of selling a successful business or they'd just done it or they'd stepped away from a high profile corporate role and they thought, right, I'll write that book now. But what they actually needed was they needed help to build a personal brand to serve as a platform through which they could sell their hard won knowledge to, you know, tell their story and inspire others profitably. Mm. And a book is part of that often. But it's not all of it. And if you don't have that audience built already, your book will fall flat. And I don't want that to happen. I want my, you know, if, if you're going to spend money with me having um, my help with your book, I want to make sure that it sells and that people read it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that was how, how her next chapter came about, because you need to get... Um, and and the reason that these women who are often very successful, they struggle because before when they were 
in their successful company or in their corporate role, they had a team around them and they didn't have a personal brand. Yeah. Now they find themselves, they often have five to 10 years of working life left you know, because that's when they want to wind things up mm. and they want to make maximum impact, but they don't know where to start. Now it's just them. Um, they feel a lack of confidence about about creating that personal brand as well. So that that led me to um, to set up her next chapter for those women who are at that kind of crossroads and they're thinking about a book. But actually, well, let's think about this holistically mm and help you to um, build a platform through which you can create the maximum impact and build your legacy, not just write a book and that's it. Yeah. Oh, I love this. Isn't that great? It really is. I mean, it's the big picture stuff, isn't it, ultimately? Mm. And so can I work with you? Um, you know, how do you work one-to-one -one, or is it groups or do you have different sort of variants of how you work with people, Helen? Um, yes, I, I have the kind of purely book offerings still under Her Next Chapter. Um, the Her Next Chapter signature programme is over, it's over a year it includes book coaching, but it we go through all the groundwork to work out who you want to serve, how you can best serve them, and how you're going to monetize that. Mm. And then, you know, my clients have the accountability to, to execute that over the course of a year, and also they have the book coaching too. So... Yeah. It's um, it's pretty intensive, but you know, I want these women to to make as much impact as they can. They deserve to do so. I think there's another thing about this: the perception can be that you write a book and suddenly it's a bestseller, or you write a book and suddenly you make lots of money. And actually, the reality is, <laughs> you are forever marketing a book. <laughs> And also I found with my book, it's been a wonderful business card, if you like. It's uh, been an additional value to speaking events. It's additional value to any coaching I do. It's always that added value piece for me, my book, as opposed to it being this one thing that sells and makes me rich. Um, and I think it's quite important to talk about that, really, when you talk about book publishing, because whilst you can look at the Harry Potter lady and say, well, it made her very rich, she is kind of a, quite a minority, really, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So. One of the first things we ever say to potential clients is you will not make a lot of money from direct sales what you will do is as you say you know you'll be able to use your business book as a fantastic business card um if you want to build your credibility mm. and position yourself as an expert in your sector this is a great way to do that but really yeah this is this is one of the lowest rungs on that value ladder of services and that's what her next chapter helps women to create yeah yeah um, so I, I also work uh, on value ladder with my sales coaching so it's it's all really very connected isn't it Helen so and uh, yes. it's exactly how I position it it's really one of the bottom rungs of that value ladder but it's still important and it's still part of that ladder and the ladder's there for a reason isn't it you know you, you know you can't just have one step on a value ladder because it's not as effective so um, I love this. You, we're very aligned. It's really, really nice. I also want to just check in on the connection then back to Catherine with the mm. business you run with her. So how does that fit into sort of people who work with you, Helen? So the idea for the BizBook Foundry was, so um, Catherine and I met through a small business marketing community, um, Andrew and Pete's Atomic Community, I know um, it, yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that they really recommend is that everyone has an accountability partner. So um, I think Catherine actually approached me because we joined at about the same time. 
and obviously we were a perfect fit I was like the writing a book woman and she was the designing the book yeah. woman um and then after we worked together for about a year I said to her Catherine I keep like having prospects and clients come to me and say but how much will it cost in in, in its entirety to yeah. self-publish my book and I was a bit like not really my specialism and and there are so many variables it's mm. hard for me to say yeah. but speak to Catherine and Catherine was funnily enough having people come to her and say well I haven't written my book yet but um but what's involved and how much would it cost and so anyway so I suggested to her in April last year well why don't we create a complete solution for self-publishing business book authors from idea to final files because there are two issues one is um the cost was not transparent people would have to um, find out how much it would cost mm -hmm. usually with our service there are an average of seven different people skill sets involved mm -hmm. um well many authors don't know the different skill sets they'd need to access no, quite. and even when they find out which takes time then they have to work out well is this person any good so we've done that work for people um so that's what it is really you you know um idea to final files which will even upload to amazon or um ingram spark for print on demand or as ebooks whatever it might be yeah, amazing so and that came up i think this is the thing isn't it when you develop products listen to your clients yeah yeah definitely and i i agree with you that most people come not really knowing who they need to help them but what they do know is that they just want to publish a book so actually that is as you say idea to final files and ingram sparks is actually the company that print my book so and i used a slightly different option where i used a hybrid publisher so, um, but, but also similar because actually um, I had a writing coach separate to the hybrid publisher and so I just had two, two sort of different people who probably did the seven things, if that makes sense, Helen. Um, but yes. I wouldn't have known what I needed, you know, particularly. Um, I, love, I love what you've done with Catherine. I love Catherine. Um, obviously, I've only just met you, but you're, you're just as adorable at the moment. Our conversation, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, and I think it's such a nice thing to come together like that when you just have those same values and those lovely skills that just come together beautifully. It's, it's great. It's great to hear that you've done that. And obviously, in the comments on the podcast, I'll put all the links that you want me to put. So if we want to link off to that business as well we will do it's absolutely fine because I'd like the listeners to find you if they need you that's amazing you. how can people get hold of you what's the best way Helen where do you hang out and I again I'll put the links but where do you hang out I think yeah my primary social media channel is LinkedIn um I put a lot of free content on there um and I'd also like to offer um a free guide to business messaging which is called the mystery of the muddled message oh I like um, that <laughs> now is that called alliteration am I trying to be clever or is no, it not quite totally that? Is. <laughs> oh I feel so clever there for a minute <laughs> I love that so yeah I mean I think you know that that causes a lot of businesses massive problems when they just can't get clear on their message. And that's one of the things that, you know, the ladies who I work with often, again, when, when they go from working for a company to it just being them, they're like really struggle to get yeah. a clear message. So yeah. that I'll give you the, the link to that. That's in my member vault. Um, right. Wonderful. So, yeah. No, that's really good because there's some real value there for our listeners right away. That's so, so kind of you, Helen. Um, and I, I just love what you're doing. I know you have mentioned that predominantly you want to work with women. So I know that the message is very much for female 
entrepreneurs uh, who may have already just sold a business from what you've told me but equally they may be successful and um, have have had a big corporate career Um, Mm. and that transition is so interesting isn't it from being very successful in corporate to suddenly running your own business such a different dynamic uh, which always fascinates me and I love that you're supporting those women who are obviously very talented to then continue that journey as, as entrepreneurs and running their own businesses. That's, that's wonderful. And hopefully producing a book on the back of it as well. So that's, that's really awesome. Um, I want your final thoughts, Helen. You don't know I'm going to ask you this because I always just drop this on my guests <laughs> because I kind of want that spontaneous thing. You know, what is that one thing you want to tell people if you're talking to them and uh, you want to give them that wise advice from what you've learned in life I think so this really surprised uh, a, post, a podcast host um and it last year last year I did an interview and this really surprised him um I think I would say money is important and anyone who knows me will know I'm not very materialistic at all but I was brought up in a family where talking about money was seen as slightly vulgar and distasteful. And what I'm telling my children is money gives you choices. Mm. Yeah. And, and by that, the reason I mention that is because so many women I work with don't want to price their services they're not pitching them at the right level and Mm. it's all about imposter syndrome and if I don't charge if I don't charge this much if I only charge a little bit then if it goes wrong it won't matter no you need to charge what you're worth please Mm. do Mm. love that I love that and I'm actually probably more that I talk about the value you give in order for you to feel you can charge that price but it's it's a similar message but I probably don't talk about the money bit up front, but I lost a business where I just literally lost everything uh, overnight. And I think that's my reason why money is one of those things that I just, I I shy away from, if that makes sense. Because I always think, you know, when I ran that business, my ultimate was I would be a millionaire. That was the, the, oh, we're going to be millionaires, you know. Whereas now when I run this business, I just, I run it because I love running it and I love the work I do. And so actually my mindset's different, but I do believe that your message is actually really important. I really, really do. And, and I thank you for saying it because I wouldn't necessarily be that person who would speak up about it. But I think it's a really great message. I think it is about what you're worth and you understanding what your value is. Um, and not feeling like that money bit is the dirty bit. Because if you build all the stuff before it, the relationship, the value, the trust, you know, the fact that you are really going to help me to do something I want to do, often price goes out the window anyway, because it's actually about that them getting that solution that they want. So, oh gosh, I could talk to you for a long time, Helen. I love <laughs> that. So thank you for that message. It's It's great. It's a really great message. And I've loved our chat, our human conversation. I hope you have too. I have. It's been a blast and crikey, where has, I don't know, 45 minutes gone? (laughs) It is easy to fill, isn't it, with me? I chat away. Um, But thank you. And I really hope the listeners have enjoyed your wonderful journey from Vogue to Aston Martin with PR and business book coaching and personal branding and obviously ghostwriting if you want a bit of that too. It's all really, really interesting. You've been fascinating as a guest. So thank you for joining me. And listeners, if you want to get in touch with Helen, do it. Do not think about it. Just do it. The links are all in the podcast. Connect with this lady and just follow her on LinkedIn for a while if that's how you want to do it. But this lady knows her stuff. So I hope you've enjoyed our human conversation today. I love making my podcast with amazing guests. And please do subscribe and like on the channel that you listen to, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and SoundCloud, all my S's. 
And you can watch our beautiful faces on YouTube because I will publish it on there as well. But for now, thanks for listening to The Human Conversation and we'll see you again really soon. Ta-ta for now. You've just been listening to The Human Conversation podcast with Jules White. To find out more about the other work that Jules does, please visit her website, www.liveitloveitsellit.co.uk. And if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave a rating and review on the platform you use to enjoy her show. Thanks for listening and see you next time.